Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us on the Q&A show, Revelation TV. We want to introduce you to a special guest tonight who's going to be answering your questions. But just before I do that, I want to say a big thank you to Nikki, who's sitting in for Leslie tonight again. And thank you very much for answering all the questions. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing uh, uh, the questions. Right. <laughs> and Grady will be reading them out. So, yeah. No, we're going to it quite seriously. Um, it is very late here, and we've got to have a bit of sense of humour to come in late at this hour. Yes. Uh, because over here in Spain, it's 11 o'clock at night. And uh, Anyway, uh, enough of me. I just want to introduce you to Dr. Grady McMurtry, who's going to be answering your questions that you have on creation, perhaps, or other Bible topics. So we want to get a proper understanding of the scriptures, and we couldn't have anyone better than Dr. Grady tonight, because there's no one else. Oh, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> Dr. Grady. All the way from yes, Maryland? Maryland, yes. And uh, just to put us right, uh, whereabouts is Maryland on that big uh, continent of the Americas? <laughs> well, I'm on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay, not, uh, not very far from Washington, D.C. Right, yeah. So if you want to uh, have uh, your questions uh, put to us live at revelationtv.com, it will scroll across your screens tonight, all the information that you need, uh, the text number, etc., and also uh, other information as to how to get in touch with Dr. Grady at creationworldview.org. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Grady, um, anything that's come up for you um, with regards to this, your main topic, which is obviously looking at creation as opposed to evolution as a way of which we were brought into this world. What, what anything to enlighten us with that's come on the news lately? Well, of course, the news has been, been mostly political, but of course, science news does come up now and then. And of course, they will always find a new dinosaur here or a new dinosaur there. And we are continuing to find new arguments that prove that the Earth and the universe are young. That's happening every month. And so there is a lot of news. So I, I would suggest that anybody who has been listening uh, to the science news that's available uh, might have some questions they want to call in about, of course, and we want to certainly endorse that. So please do. Wonderful. Great. Now, um, Nikki, have you ever thought uh, as a, a Christian that, you know, at any time in your you know, introduction to Christianity. Well, you know, what were the origins of life? Is it something that is, because I've not talked to you about yeah. this before, but I mean, did you ever have a problem uh, when you read the book of Genesis, for example, about, you know, that God created us in his image and et cetera, or, or at school, did you sort of uh, favor more what you were probably taught on the theory of evolution? Yeah, so I was sort of brought up as a Christian, so I've always had the belief that creation was the way that the, the world was made and everything. And yeah, I, I think it makes sense to me that, because I can understand why you, you start at the basis, don't you? Some people say, well, where did the Big Bang come from and where did God come from? That's a question that we're never really going to know until we get to heaven and we can ask God, God himself. Like, because we, our human brains can't comprehend where God's come from. So that's kind of a basis where to start. But then to just suddenly say everything just exploded, I, I believe that if there's an explosion, everything just carries on going into chaos. How did the world get into the order that we're in and things are... Uh, how they are if god didn't create it god didn't make a plan god didn't create us in his image like you say um so yeah i just think creation makes a lot more sense and, and okay. the fact but that god's ever, given it to us do you ever think though about the state of the world though you know it, 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 i mean it's not the way god intended it no. to be but we rather messed up our environment and we've also uh, talking about the things in which uh, man is uh, is in quite inhumane inhumane mm -hmm. you know we've got children that have been blown up to pieces and people having their heads cut off and things like that you know and uh, these are the things in the news uh, on a daily basis. And I'd like to ask Grady, until we get some of the emails that are coming in, um, you know, when one of the questions I was um, asked, if I'm witnessing to somebody, Grady, is, you know, why does God allow things to be so chaotic? Why does he allow us? How d why didn't he intervene in human history um, to actually put things right, especially when it comes to those who suffer in ter terrible uh, situations. Take, take for example, a, a baby that's born um, that with major defects. If God created us in the beginning and he, would, he created us perfect, he said, in fact, in the book of Genesis, it was very good. Not just good, it was very good. So when you have people that you're trying to convince that 
um, that God is the, our creator. Um, how do you answer the fact that, you know, he, he, did God make a mistake or did something happen in the period from the day of creation to where we are now? Well, God didn't make any mistakes. But what happened was that human sin, human mistakes, is what caused the degeneration from the perfect state of 6,000 years ago. So first of all, you can't blame God for that. Humans are the ones who decided not to follow God's law and instituted what's called human autonomy, which is law unto self. Now, in terms of the pain, sickness, and death, we, of course, wonder at times about this. Everybody does. However, God can take even our defects and use them for his glorification. Now, why do we have pain, sickness, death, etc.? Is because, number one, human sin. Number two, I want you to think about this. If nothing bad ever happened to us, then being a Christian would be very easy. You'd have an easy believism. And God is not looking for easy believism. What he wants is people who will worship him for who he is, not for what he does. Mm -hmm. And so if he were to interfere with that, if he were to make everything just perfect all the time, it would do away with free will. And so God gave us perfect, 100% free will, we chose not to obey his law, so we are responsible, not him. But in having adversity, it's actually good for us. I know that it doesn't seem that way. We, none of us like those things. But, but if we didn't have adversity, we would have nothing to reject. We would have nothing to fight against. We would become weak. By having adversity, we remain strong. And so even our suffering does have a good purpose. Okay, let me ask you this then. You, you mentioned something there, which I'm sure um, people would take you up on, and I'm going to ask on their behalf. How do you come up with this uh, figure of 6,000 years ago uh, when God created us? How do you come up with that when everybody, including David Attenborough, sorry, Sir David Attenborough, would say it was uh, millions or billions of years ago? Well, Sir David is, of course, a convinced evolutionist. But evolution is a religion. It's not science. There's not one scientific proof that it is old. Evolutionists have five major arguments to suggest, to deceive people into believing in millions and billions of years. Today, we have over 350 scientific arguments to show that the Earth, solar system, galaxy, and universe are young. Uh, we have over 160 of them in short videos available on our website under Did You Know programs. In addition to which, of course, we have produced DVDs with major arguments, but only the ones that are easy to understand. Mm -hmm. We don't produce things that people can't understand. We don't get very technical. But the fact of the matter is, science alone would be sufficient to realize that the creation is young. Biblically, we look at the genealogies. Clearly, the genealogies of Jesus, particularly the genealogy of Mary, because the genealogy of Mary goes all the way back to Adam, clearly proves that it's only about 6,000 years old. Now, we're give or take 20 years, of course, but, but basically 6,000 through the genealogies. I would also point out that, for instance, Jesus said Adam and Eve were there at the beginning. Jesus did not say they came along millions and billions of years later. And the first word of the Bible in Hebrew is not in the beginning, but in Hebrew it is at the beginning. And that's when God created time. And then we have the creation week of seven days. And the Adam and Eve were created on day six. So when Jesus says Adam and Eve were there at the beginning, they're there on the sixth day of creation. Now, that's a 24-hour day? Absolutely. And there are many verses that, that support that. Of course, uh, God says it's one period of lightness, one period of light, one period of darkness, it's one day. Uh, he uses numbers, day one, day two, day three, meaning specifically. 
But again, the best verses outside of Genesis Exodus. would be to go to Exodus chapter 20. Exactly. It's where I'm going right now. In Exodus 20, in the middle of giving the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. God stops in verses 8 to 11. He says, you shall work six literal days and rest one because I did. Yep. So we wouldn't be t talking about anything but a 24-hour day because um, we wouldn't be here long enough uh, if it was millions of years uh, or th even thousands of years for a, a day, would we? Yeah. And, and again, each of the days could not be millions of years. You, yeah. you couldn't have a million years of darkness and then a million years of light. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of contradictions to the idea that these days are not 24 hours. Yeah. Well, these are very good uh, scriptures for people to note down who are trying to talk to others, because uh, we often get asked this question. So make a note of that, Exodus 20, and uh, particularly uh, verses 9, okay? And then you've got others which are thinking uh, Colossians 1.15, is that right? I think as well where it talks where Jesus talks about, uh, oh, talks about Jesus being our the one who initiated everything in the beginning yeah, as well. Yeah, Colossians 1.16 yeah. is the one that I use most often for that. that yeah. He is the creator of the universe, the co-creator yeah. with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and he often refers to as well, uh, is it not written, uh, that in, and then he refers to the different things that happened in times past. Uh, he, uh, like he said, I was before Abraham was, because you know, it's amazing how many people don't realize that or didn't realize that Jesus Christ uh, pre-existed in that sense in the heavens, you know, was there with the Father. Um, and that's why you get that scripture in Genesis one where it talks about um, that let us make man in our image. So that it was plural, not singular. Okay. And Jesus uh, taught from Genesis more than any other book of the Old Testament. He did, didn't he? Yeah. And I would bring attention particularly to John chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. Remind me. He is talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and he says, if you do not believe what Moses wrote, yes. you have no need of me. Right. Very good. And that was John? John chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. Okay. I'm going to make a note of that because I forgot about that one. Very good. Okay. Uh, any questions coming in? Yes, there's lots of emails coming in. So I just want to remind you guys that we are live tonight. So if you'd like to ask Dr. Grady a question, you can email live at revelationtv.com or the number that's coming up on the screen. But yes, we do have lots coming in. Jean says, hello, Howard and Dr. Grady. When we come to believe in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and forgotten by God. If they are forgotten, on what will we be judged at the very end? Thank you. From Jean. Well, indeed, remember that we sin every day. The only thing that stops you sinning in the secular sense is death. And so even though you become a Christian and you are forgiven, you are still continuing to sin. The Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, specifically states this. Uh, however, we do mature. We sin less. Now, at death... We have finished sinning. We are going to go to heaven because of the gift of grace through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now, is there anything that God does not know? The answer is no. So he knows all of our sins. What it does say in the Old Testament is that he puts our sins into the sea of his forgetfulness. Meaning, he doesn't forget them but as an act of his personal will, mm -hmm. he chooses not to remember them against us. Very good. Thank God for that. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Can you define sin for us so that uh, everyone understands that? Because that it, it's hard for some, especially in our modern age, to admit that we're sinners. You know, so it, it, perhaps a, a definition there from a learned man like yourself would help us. <laughs> Well, the, the simple definition of sin, of course, originates from things like archery, meaning to miss the mark. So God has his law. He explains it to us in the Old Testament as well as in the New, because he does, does talk about it in the New Testament. Is that Paul's word? And let's just take, let's just take the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Can anyone perfectly live the Ten Commandments their entire life without breaking them once? Nope. 
Therefore, if we break the law, any law of God, then we have committed a sin. And so that's where the concept of sin, that's where the ramifications of sin come, is to break God's law. And let's take a look at the Garden of Eden. There was only one law. Adam and Eve couldn't keep that one law. What, what chance do we have with a million laws in the books today? <laughs> you know? So we are all going to break the law at some point, uh, even if it's just running a stop sign. Right. Okay. So the sin is to miss the mark of the perfect standard which God has set for us. If it was a target, uh, we're a million miles off the bullseye, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Oh, this one's from Mike. He says, when and why did Darwin's theory of evolution become what now appears to be the fact of evolution? Well, evolution is not a fact. And in a technical scientific sense, it's not even a theory. It's just that as the common usage, we call it a theory. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the details of that, but, but actually it's a working hypothesis. Now, Charles Darwin did not originate the idea of evolution. The idea of evolution can be traced philosophically, religiously, back to the Garden of Eden. So there have always been those who believed in evolution since the Garden, and always those who have believed in creation. But how could they believe from the beginning? Because they were, they were there at the beginning, so therefore they knew that they were created. I, even Adam and Eve's children would have known that from their parents that they were created. So how far along from Adam and Eve was it that the theory, it was, if you like, or the belief that God had created things over a long period of time? Let me do a quick history. Thank you. Two apostles of the early church in Romans chapter 1, Acts chapter 17, 2 Peter chapter 3, are talking about the scientific aspects of creation versus evolution. Because the Greek and Roman philosophers were teaching evolution for 600 years before Christ was born. I get that. But it goes back further. Go to the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges was written 3,000 to 3,400 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Judges, it twice says when they had no one to rule over them, each person did what was right in their own eyes or sight. Yeah. You see, in order to have law, you must have a lawgiver. Mm -hmm. God is the lawgiver. When you deny the existence of God, you deny the existence of his laws, and then we start writing our own. Have you got that so scripture? Sorry, Grady, have you, I know there's a slight delay, but have you got that scripture in Judges so I can mark it? Uh, chapter 17 and 21, I believe. 17, 20, there isn't a 21. Well, it's chapter 17 and chapter 20. Um, okay. I have to look up the verses that's myself. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just get, I've got the chapters, that's good. So chapter 17 and chapter 20. And 21, I believe. Okay, thank you. When they had no one to rule over them. Yeah, they did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. Each woman did what was right in their own eyes or sight, which is, I write my own rules. Yeah, which is what but pretty much the philosophy of today is for everybody, everybody almost. <laughs> well, that's the evolutionary philosophy of today. Right, okay. But it goes back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Think about it for a moment. God gave them one law. You can do anything you want except eat from this one tree. Mm -hmm. Now, the first sin occurred when Adam and Eve challenged God's veracity, meaning they decided for themselves that they could decide whether God was telling the truth or not. Now, God cannot lie. They had no right to come to that conclusion, that they had a right to decide whether God was telling the truth or not. Seems a bit hard. But, but when they decided to challenge God's veracity and decided that they had a right to, to determine whether God was telling the truth or not, they chose to then start human autonomy. Mm -hmm. Now, this occurs as Satan then deceives Eve, and he says, has God said? Did he really mean that? Mm -hmm. Putting doubt in their minds. Tempting and he them. says yeah. to them, 
oh no, God didn't really mean that. He's actually just holding out on you. That he knows that if you knew what he knew, then you'd be just like him. The appeal to being your own God. Okay, and just to put and the record- so the, the, the first deception of Satan is evolutionary philosophy. Mm. And just to put the record straight, because quite a lot of people, when you talk to them about the, the origins of man and we're talking about Adam and Eve, they would say that they had sinned sexually. And of course, that wasn't the case because the, the very fact that God had said, uh, be fruitful and become many and all of that was part of his design for actually procreation. So, you know. Well, God just, created them for two reasons. Number one, to, to worship him voluntarily and to fill the earth. So in, in procreating, they were fulfilling God's commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. This one is from Ken. He says, hi, Howard. Great to see Dr. Grady again and you ably assisted by Nikki. I'd like to express my pleasure at the regular discoveries of dinosaur fossils, bones, etc., which all point to a young earth as confirmed by the Bible. My question to Dr. Grady is, has there been or have you heard of any shift in position of evolutionists, any from their previous beliefs? Good question. Well, of course, the standard evolutionist doesn't change their view. There are those evolutionists who do come to the conclusion that creation is true and may become Christians. But you can be a creationist without being a Christian. But you yourself are a testimony that you actually changed your mind from being uh, one who believed in evolution to um, having read the scriptures and studied them for some 18 months, if I remember rightly, um, actually uh, converted, if you like, to the biblical view of creation rather than the evolutionist view. I spent six months studying the question, was Jesus telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Was he the son of God? Was he God? I came to the conclusion that he was telling the truth. I became a Christian. That made me a saved evolutionist. I spent 16 more months studying the idea. Did God use evolution to create what we see around us? Was what I had learned and taught others okay? Or did he actually create it whole and complete as, as recorded the Bible? Okay. Um, so we've just lost your picture, but stay with us, Dr. Grady, because your voice is very clear. Well, I, I will stay with you. I, I know what happened, but I can't change it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, sounds it, like it'll God's clear up in just a moment. <laughs> it'll clear up in a moment. It'll clear. Okay. Um, after a 16 months, of looking at scientific law, natural process, and the physical evidence, which I was very familiar with. I came to the conclusion that God did create 6,000 years ago in six little 24 hour days because it's good science. There is no law of science. There is no natural process that can be explained or predicted by any theory of evolution. And only some of the physical evidence that could be explained or, or useful to the evolutionists, but, but all of the evidence is consistent with creation. Now, in science, this is called a proof, it's an indirect method. So what you do is when you can't test something directly, and you cannot test creation or evolution directly. It's not possible. It would require time travel and many other things to do it. Exactly. Both are accepted by faith. Both have a religious element. Interesting. The question becomes, which faith is the one that is evidence-based? And I say categorically that none of it fits with evolution and everything fits with creation. So you can be a creationist without even being a Christian. After all, there are Jews who believe in creation and a young earth. There are Muslims who believe in creation and a young earth. That's not a Christian position, but it is the Christian position based upon what the Bible tells us. And, of course, the scientific evidence tells us it's only about 6,000 years old. Hmm. 
Uh, a, a supplementary question there uh, with regards to the, the, the question from the viewer is you know of people who, uh, who are not Christian but are actually um, scientists themselves. I think there's a lady who actually also accepts uh, uh, our view of, of a young creation. I'm trying to remember her name, but I'll never, uh, it's been too long ago. Well, I'm afraid you might be thinking of a paleontologist. Yes. Uh, who does claim to be a Christian, but believes in an old earth, actually. No, no, that's not the one then. Um, so I'm not <laughs> sure which one you're thinking okay, of. Okay, yeah, it, it, maybe it was, uh, it's a long time ago um, in Bethlehem, you know, but anyway, I, I know that <laughs> there are many people who, as you say, uh, are not Christians, but are actually scientists who've also come to the conclusion that we yes. are a young creation. That's the point we're trying and I to make. Have, yeah. I have been personally involved where evolutionists have become Christians and creationists. Uh, and I know of many others, but I've been directly involved with some of them. Right. Okay, um, next question. Next Thank question. You, this one is from James. He says, hi all. Does Grady think fallen angels and demons are different? It seems to me that they are not the same, although the origin of demons is not clear. Is there any clue from a clue where they came from? Well, again, fallen angels and demons are the same thing. They're demonic spirits. It's the same thing we sometimes call uh, Satan, the devil, the dragon, uh, other terms that are used for the same entity. Mm. Uh, they were rebellious creatures uh, which were in the heavens to start with, but obviously uh, pretty much sided with, um, I think it was a third of the angels actually uh, one, sided. One third of the angels rebel. That's it. Now, there are some of them that rebelled and are more wicked than the others, though they are all evil. But there are some that are particularly heinous and were cast to Tartarus, but eventually all of them will be taken care of. Um, no, I, I, I won't deviate into some of the other things which are a little bit spurious, but yeah, I was tempted to there, but I'm not going to. Um, right, Nikki, next <laughs> we'll one. Move on, next yeah. one. Um, this, uh, there's been a couple of emails that have come in about a, a recent news story that I think is happening in Australia. Um, this one is from Dorian. It says, there was a news item recently which said people in Australia are not having wisdom teeth and therefore smaller jaws and said this was evolutionary. Have you heard of this? And if so, what is your opinion on it? God bless. Well, first of all, let's get a little closer to that. Most people still have wisdom teeth. However, uh, many people are getting them extracted. And that's because we are not getting bigger, better, faster, smarter. We're getting smaller, slower, and dumber. And as we are getting smaller, our jaws are getting smaller, and so wisdom teeth are having to be extracted because there's not enough space for them anymore. And if somebody's born without them, it is simply because that mutation of, of not having wisdom teeth came into their genetic line. But that is a copying error in which the information for the wisdom teeth has been eliminated. So this is not progressive evolution. This is actually showing the process of decay from perfection. Okay. Um, right. Um, there's so many other side questions I'd love to ask, but I'm, I don't want to get in the way of the viewers. Go on. Right. Uh, this one is from Marcus. Hello, Marcus. He says, is Hades really in the center of the earth? If so, what does it look like? <laughs> Have you been? Well, I don't plan on doing any personal experiments, so... <laughs> Well, uh, here's the thing. The Bible tends to indicate, certainly, that hell, Hades, the underworld, uh, could be inside the earth. Now, do we have any direct evidence of that? No. But we have to remember that the natural and the supernatural can exist in the same place at the same time. Therefore, it may or may not be in the earth. But yes, it's described that way. By the same token, it could be metaphorically. So there's no definitive answer. But everything in the scriptures tends to indicate that it is in the earth. 
this one. Thank you. Uh, this one is from Karen. He's, she says, sorry, good evening. Please, can you share your opinion on what is the difference between the soul and the spirit, please? Thank you. They are two entirely different things. God is a triune being. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In creating humans in his image, he creates us as triune beings with a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, to cover this quickly, the soul is the intellect, the emotion, and the will. It is what makes the body animate. So we have a biological body. The soul is the intellect, emotion, and will. The spirit is separate. The spirit is your eternal essence. And because of this, your soul, because it is united with the spirit, has an eternal nature. However, higher animals such as cats and dogs, cows and elephants, dinosaurs, whatever, have a soul, but they do not have a spirit. They are temporal beings. And the best place to find this is in Ecclesiastes chapter three, you want to read around verse 19, and in Ecclesiastes 12, specifically verse seven. And it give, me those two, give me those two scriptures again, because these, this one comes up a lot. Uh, so give, okay. give me those two again. This Ecclesiastes. If you go to Ecclesiastes. Yeah. And in Ecclesiastes, we want to go to chapter three. Yeah. In chapter three, you want to be reading in the areas of verse 19. Yep. Notice it's, it says there, for the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts, meaning animals, is mm -hmm. the same. As one dies, so dies the other. So all biological creatures die. Yep. Notice it says they all have the same breath. Now, the Hebrew word there is nefesh. It's the same word that's used in Genesis 2, 7, when God breathes the soul, the yep. breath of life. In Hebrew, it is the word nefesh. Yep into the body of Adam, and his body becomes animate, becomes alive. And verse 19 says there's no advantage for man over beast. All of us die biologically. And then it says in verse 20, all of us go to the same place, meaning in the ground. We came from the dust, we return to the dust, our bodies are going to decay. But notice in verse 21, who knows that the breath of man ascends upward, that is, the soul ascends upward, and the breath of the beast ascends downward. That animals are temporary, that their soul goes into the ground, they cease to exist. But the soul of the person goes up. Now, go to chapter 12. Of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Of Ecclesiastes. And we want to take a look specifically at verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So because the spirit is united with the soul in a human, when the biological body dies, the spirit and soul continues on. And so they are different. The spirit is who you really are. And you live inside a tabernacle, the body, which is a physical tent. And your, your brain, your intellect, your emotion and will is, is telling the body what to do and decisions that are being made in the, in the secular natural realm. But you have a spiritual component, which is separate, and that is your eternal essence. Yeah, because everybody... So I, oh, oh. I thought you were going to take a break there, sorry. Um, yeah, so the question that always comes up is, will my cat, will my dog uh, be there? Will they be resurrected? Over, over, over the years, we've talked about this I know. probably half I just a dozen want, times. That's why I want the scriptures. Yes, and, and yeah. unfortunately, because... You know, I, I had a dog in my life that was very important to me when I was a young person. I know others, the same thing. I know mm -hmm. people are listening, the same thing. Now, there will be creatures in heaven, but they will not be our resurrected pets. Yeah, okay. The, the pets that we've had in the past, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Yeah. The body mm -hmm. goes underground and suffers decay. And their soul, their intellect, their emotional will goes into the ground and cease to exist because they do not have a spirit. But even though it says there that man has no advantage over the beast, they're all, uh, it's vanity, so but they're it, all same breath. But that is but that is referring to all of us die. Mm -hmm. but you we are all in a biological body. Right. Okay. And uh, all the way through to verse 21. Thank you. 
I, I'm just going to study that again. I, I, so about 50 years ago since I read that scripture. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we did talk about uh, we're ancient of days these days, uh, the two of us. Okay, right. Very good. Next one. Okay, this one's from John. He says, a lot of Word of Faith slash Pentecostals believe that Jesus' miracles were performed by him as a man with the Holy Spirit only and not as Jesus as God to prove his deity. What are your thoughts on this? Surely Jesus performed the miracles as God and not as man only by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is referred to as the Theanthropos. That's Greek. Theos is God. Theology is the study of God. Anthropos is the ancient word for man, as in anthropology is the study of man. And Jesus is the perfect Theanthropos. He is 100% man, and he is 100% God. And because he is 100% God, he can perfectly separate his statements in the scriptures, and he at times can speak perfectly as God, and he can do miracles as God. And there are other times when he is speaking perfectly as man. For instance, when he says, only the Father knows about the return. Now, Jesus is God. He and the Father are one. In his Godhood, he would know. But when asked that question, he chooses to answer the question only in his humanity. And he's the only one who is perfectly capable of dividing the two and speaking as one under one occasion and another under another occasion. But he is God and he can do miracles. As a matter of fact, he says, if you kill his body, he will raise it up after three, two and a half days on the third day. And so obviously he's speaking as God at that point with the power of life and death. Wow. Getting some deeper questions yes, today. Yeah. Next one. You uh, can this ask. one goes back to evolution. This is from Peter. He says, I'm a Christian, and when confronted by the theory of evolution, I reply, why are we not seeing the phenomenon of evolution still taking place? Is this a valid approach? Unfortunately, to the evolutionists, it really isn't. Uh, because they will simply say, well, it is occurring today. It just occurs so slowly that we can't see it during our lifetime or over a few lifetimes because supposedly it takes millions and billions of years. The, the response is it occurs too slowly to see. Now, I would point out that there are evolutionists who realize that this is not true. They, they can see that it's not true but they still believe in evolution. And so they came up with a concept referred to as punctuated equilibria. And uh, I know that's a mouthful. It is. But it's the idea that no evolution occurs in a particular species for millions of years. And then suddenly, in two, three, four generations, there's a rapid burst of upward progressive evolution. And then we have stasis or no change again for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And what punctuated equilibria is saying is that things remain flat for a long time with no change. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's this rapid burst, again only two or three, four generations, and then there's another period of level plane. And so their answer to why we can't see evolution today is because they say it occurs too fast to see. You can't win. So the evolution, the evolution says either it occurred too slowly to see or too fast to see, but the rational person has to understand that that means you just can't see it. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> right. Okay, next one. This one's from Kevin. He says, good evening. Can you tell me what was holding the mass of water and land in the beginning of creation when the Holy Spirit hovered over the water? If nothing was created, then how was there water and land beneath it and was there gravity in existence? Good question. First of all, in verse 1, Genesis 1, the last thing that God creates is the earth. He creates time first. In Hebrew it says, at the beginning. He creates space second. The, he creates the heavens. Then he creates the earth, which is matter or mass. When you have matter or mass, you will automatically have gravity. So uh -huh. there's gravity at the end of verse 1. 
Right. In verse 2, when it says that uh, the Holy Spirit is moving over the surface of the waters, God spoke the earth into existence somewhat like a lump of clay. It is slightly egg-shaped. It is not a perfect sphere. And when it says moving, that's an agricultural term in the Hebrew language. And it means the way a chicken broods an egg. So how does a chicken brood an egg? Well, she creates the egg. And then she warms one side, and she will also reach down and rotate it occasionally with the cold side up and the warm side down. And this occurs in complete and total darkness. And the earth is the only object in the universe for three days. God does not create the sun and the moon and the stars until day four. So for the first three days, only the earth exists as mass, and there is gravity in the earth, but it's not being held by other things. It's just there. And in darkness, the Holy Spirit starts the rotation of the earth the way a chicken rotates an egg. Then after the earth is rotating, on day one, the last thing does is God does is he creates light. And the light is traveling in one direction because as the earth is rotating, we now have one period of darkness, one period of light, one rotation, one day. And, of course, continuous since then. You, you so you have to understand what the scripture actually says in Hebrew, not in an English translation. Okay. Um, Dr. Grady, when you explain things like that, it, it sounds, uh, yeah, plausible. Um, but I'm sure people would still find it very hard to comprehend that God would almost be hatching the earth like that but not not hatch he he creates the earth which is somewhat egg-shaped it's it's wider than it is tall mm -hmm. and in darkness there's no light now when a chicken is rotating an egg what is she doing she's incubating the system right, exactly it's brooding she's energizing the systems mm-hmm now, in the same way, God created the earth. He spoke it into existence. He created it. There is water on the surface. And the Holy Spirit is, starts the rotation, and at that point, he is incubating the earth. He is energizing the systems. If you know anything about raising chickens, you could have a fertilized egg, heat it on one side, never rotate it, and it will not develop. Mm. Okay. All right. That's, That's a lot of sense. Can you yeah. remember that one? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'll try. <laughs> um, this one's from David. He says, good evening all. The four Gospels are confusing regarding the crucifixion. In John, it says Jesus was crucified on a Friday during Passover. Yet in Matthew, Mark and Luke, it seems it was actually the next day. Have I read it wrong? Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But isn't there a, a special days at that time where there was the special Passover? Well, you have to you have to the yes and no then. something like <laughs> uh, I no no I wrote a book on the feasts I did a DVD presentation with RTV about this it's a half an hour program maybe you could catch it sometime but Jesus did not die on a Friday he died on a Thursday. And you can prove this from the scripture using two specific proofs, not having to believe me. But if we go to the feast of the Old Testament and specifically go to Exodus chapter 12, God institutes a new calendar. He takes the seventh month of the first calendar, the month of Nisan, makes it the first month of a religious calendar. He then says on the 10th day of the month, you select a lamb in Egypt. You inspect it for four days. On the 14th day, you slay the lamb, but you eat it that night, which is the 15th. And then, if you'll take a look at Leviticus chapter 23, all seven major feasts are mentioned in one chapter. And the 17th day of Nisan is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, consider for just a moment, the 17th day of Nisan is the day the ark came to rest in Genesis 8, 4. Is it? It's the right. day they walked through the Red Sea in Exodus. Mm -hmm. It's the day they ate of the first fruits in Joshua chapter 5. And it's the day that Christ rose from the dead. 
Now, I think we will all agree Jesus was chosen on a Sunday. We call that Palm Sunday. And he rose on a Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Now, people don't realize this, but if you simply count off, the 14th day was when he was chosen. That's, that was the day he was chosen, and that's the day he was crucified. And his body was placed in the ground on the 14th, which is Thursday afternoon. He is then in the ground all of the 15th, which is Thursday night and Friday, all the 16th, which is Friday night and Saturday, and a half a day on Saturday night, which is the 17th. And when it says in Matthew 28, 1, Notice it says sabbaths, it's plural, at least in the Greek. If your Bible doesn't have it's plural, it should be. And what it's referring to is that there are seven extra sabbaths or shabbats in every year. And they are specific calendar dates. They are not specific days, they're specific calendar dates. The first two shabbatons, as they are called, is the first day of Passover, which is the 15th day. The lamb is slain on the 14th, but the lamb is eaten on the 15th. Now, the year Jesus died, Sunday was the 10th. He was chosen as the lamb according to the law of Moses. He was selected as a lamb and crucified on the 14th, which was the day you slay the lamb. 15th is an extra Sabbath. It's a Shabbaton. And that's Thursday night and Friday. Then Friday, which is the 16th, is the regular Sabbath that you would have every week of the year, regardless of what date it is. Mm -hmm. And Sunday was the 17th, which is the Feast of First Fruits, which is the day that he rose from the dead. Now, you can calculate that by just using the Jewish calendar. In addition to which, you'll notice if you read the four Gospels, particularly in John, it says it was the preparation day. Because of the preparation day, the bodies had to be taken down. Now, every 14th day of Nisan, regardless of the day of the week, is the preparation day. Because any day before a Sabbath is a preparation day. What people don't realize is the year Jesus died, there were two Sabbaths back to back. And so there was the Shabbaton on the 15th, the regular Sabbath on the 16th and the Feast of First Fruits on the 17th. And so we can prove using two different methods of proof. The concept of Good Friday is not true. And if you have a Bible that actually used the word Friday, it is not in the Greek. That was added by somebody promoting their particular position of how the scriptures should be translated. That's their bias. Can I just, uh, that is quite confusing, Grady. Thank you very much for trying to explain it, though. Okay, let's go back to the first time uh, the Passover was uh, introduced, and that was nice and 14. Uh, Exodus chapter 12. Yeah. Exodus chapter 12. Right. So now, was that in the... Verse e one and two, in verse 1 and 2, God creates a new calendar. I want you to make this month right. the first month of a new calendar. There was a civil calendar from... Genesis chapter 1 to the time of Moses, and it continued. Okay. But at the time of the Exodus, God takes the seventh month, the month of Nisan, mm -hmm. the, that's on the civil calendar, and makes it the first month of a new calendar for religious events. Okay. So as you read, on the tenth day of the month, mm -hmm. they select a lamb. Yep. And continue to read. On the 14th day of the month, you slay the lamb. At what time but of the you, day did they do that? I just, I'm just trying to they get my slay the, They slay the lamb, depending upon your translation. Yeah. But it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, so it's, it, that, it, it it's says, not the following day. That's what I want to make. Not the sure. following day. Okay. On the 14th at 3 p.m. Right. Now, you might have a translation that says between the evenings. That's right. But in the King James Bible, what they wrote about evenings would be afternoons today. How the confusing. Jewish day is divided into four pieces, early and late morning, 
mm -hmm. early and late afternoon. Yeah. And the Jewish... And between the afternoons is 3 p.m. Right. And the day, uh, what time of the day was the, it considered the next day? Was it 6 o'clock in the morning? That's where... I, or that's, 6 o'clock in the evening? Sorry? Not exactly. The date changes 90 minutes after sunset. Which is the evening of the... Well, of, it's more than that. It's night. Okay. I know, but it's confusing it's, for us who have a 24-hour day from 12 I midnight understand. to 12 o'clock. So, yeah. We, we change the date at midnight. Yeah. But that's not the way the Jewish calendar works. Right, exactly. So that would get you into and, a different day. And the Jewish calendar, remember, the Jews are Oriental in the way they think of time, where we are Occidental. So we, we divide the day into 24 it. hours that are exactly <laughs> the same every hour. Okay. But in Judaism, the length of the hour depends upon the season of the year. Because of the sunset. Because it's 90 minutes after sunset. And the reason right. for 90 minutes goes back to Genesis. Wow. Remember, the day in Genesis starts at night. There was one period of darkness, one period of day of yes. light, right. one rotation. Okay, good. Now, it is not sunset, which many Christians think, because at sunset, there's still daylight visible, what's called twilight. Mm -hmm. So you've got to go 90, 90 minutes, minutes past that. After twilight begins, 90 minutes after sunset is when the date changes. Okay. So it's in the evening. And again, it could be 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. But, you know, on our way, we're talking about time. Because it changes as the seasons change. Right. Okay, having spent a lot of time going into that, but it is important to understand why the people's timing or dates of the, uh, when Jesus died and uh, rose from the dead and all that could be e miscalculated, yeah. that's all. Okay, great question. I wish you hadn't asked it. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm conscious that we're running out of time, yeah. but we do have Les that um, just emailed in. It's not really a question, but um, just to say, it is obvious that something like a watch and many other man-made things did not happen by accident, that someone designed and made them. It is even more obvious that creation could not have happened by accident, that a creator God, the God of the Bible, is behind it. And today, because of scientific knowledge, we know how complex creation is uh, and uh, what about life and only God can create life and that he is the source of life. So, yes. Amen. Thank yeah. you, Les, for that. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well, what I'd like. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Well said. Uh, what I'd like we got in this next minute, uh, Grady, we're living in very strange times. What, what would you say to our viewers who are trying to cope or, or understand or contemplate what the future holds? What would you say to them as a, as a way of encouragement um, and support for those who are suffering one way or another, whether it's mentally, physically, or monetary? Well, of course, God is our source, and he has not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us a sound mind. And he's told us, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough concerns of its own, correct? Correct. And so while we are to take precautions,